um, do you have the presentation handy, Professor? Uh, yes, I should be able to get it. Let's see. Um, yep. Okay, great. So uh, what, what I will do is uh, I will say a, a couple of words by way of presentation. So that's yeah. Good. Yeah. And um, and at, and at that point we're gonna we're gonna at this point we're gonna let uh, the folks that wait in for the YouTube class right. access. And and great. Just remind me how long approximately would you like me to speak for? For about forty five minutes to an hour. Okay. Great. And will there be questions at the end? I, I think that the questions will be probably I'll have a couple of questions, but uh, here's, okay. the problem, here's the problem with the general public, which is uh, there is a time delay of about 40 seconds from this platform you, you and I are on at the moment. Okay. Okay. And the YouTube platform, which makes it a little bit cumbersome. So okay. I, I, I'm no, have, no problem. I'm gonna have no a couple of questions and and um, I'll be there. Okay, great. Okay, so from this point onwards, uh, we're gonna be live on the uh, YouTube platform as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna put this on slideshow. All right, welcome to everyone. Um, on behalf of the Dramatic School, my name is Alvaro Rodriguez, and I'm going to be your host. Good evening. A week of today, new series of lectures that's going to take us from the classical world to the world times. And we're going to start with um, one of the main characters of our time, perhaps his most magnetic character, uh, Cleopatra. And to talk about her, we are lucky to have. Uh, professor Strauss. He is a professor of history and classics at the university and a former chair of his history department. He has written nine books translated into 19 different languages, including to Spanish. He's been he's the recipient of numerous fellowships all over the world, sits in several editorial boards, and he has written pieces for Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The LA Times, and various other newspapers and publications. He is a scholar who has gone beyond the boundaries of academia and made a wider audience for himself among the general public with books such as The Battle of Salamis, The Trojan War, The Death of Caesar, and Caesars, as well as the last one, The War That Made the Roman Empire. One of the preeminent historians of the generations could not be any happier, any luckier than having him today addressing the United economy and hopefully to us, and the general public as well. And, and Professor, we are excited to um, have you here and uh, anxious to hear what you have to say. Well, Thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Alvaro uh, Rodriguez, and to um, the ministry for this invitation. It's a great honor. I'm very, very pleased to be here today uh, to talk about this very important subject of uh, great states, women in history. And uh, I'm delighted to be able to kick off the series with Cleopatra, um, a subject that I very much enjoy uh, talking about. So the first question that we really have to ask about Cleopatra is, did she really exist? Was Cleopatra a real historical figure? Because many of us will be familiar with Cleopatra uh, from, uh, from the media, uh, for, for, instance, for instance, from Hollywood, uh, with this memorable portrayal of Cleopatra by uh, Elizabeth Taylor. Or uh, on a more highbrow mode, we might know of her uh, through uh, Shakespeare's play, Antony and Cleopatra, one of the great poetic dramas. But Cleopatra is a figure that speaks to popular culture in many different ways. Uh, here in the United States, uh, uh, she's been a particular significance to African-Americans who have uh, uh, often thought of Cleopatra as a black woman, 
uh, as an African. Uh, here, for instance, uh, is a recent piece of art uh, by uh, Mr. Marshall, I believe his name is. It shows Africa, Africa reimagined, but it's also known as Cheryl is Cleopatra. Cheryl is the artist's wife. So who was Cleopatra and who was the real Cleopatra uh, as, uh, as opposed to the figure of, as I said, a popular culture? Well, she really was a historical figure. We may be looking at the bust of Cleopatra. There's more than a dozen uh, busts in the museums of the world that have been identified by various scholars as Cleopatra. And there's a great deal of debate as to which really is and, and isn't Cleopatra. But this one found in the Vatican Museum uh, has received the uh, the most consensus, the most agreement that this, this represents the queen, who really was uh, a historical figure. And here, except alas for her nose, you can see here represented as the subject of Greek or Roman portraiture. This is only one of the ways in which she allowed herself to be represented. Here's another one. Here is a coin. If you could see the whole coin, it would say in Greek, Basilisa Cleopatra, Queen Cleopatra. You can see that she's here in profile. Uh, as in the bust we just show, saw, she's wearing uh, the ribbon of royalty. Uh, this was favored rather than a crown uh, in, uh, in Greek antiquity. She's wearing, uh, not so easy to tell, she's wearing uh, pearls. She's wearing jewelry. Her hair is very carefully uh, coiffed. Uh, it would have taken uh, not one, but probably several hairdressers to uh, get her hair in shape. And she's in profile and she has a delicate, she has delicate features, uh, charming, maybe even pretty. But Cleopatra should not be thought of as a sex symbol, certainly not primarily as a sex symbol, although she would use her charms as one of her ways to succeed. Uh, if she um, had had been a, a total success in her career, uh, we would think of her as one of the great powerful women of antiquity. Here we're looking at Elizabeth I of England. Oh, maybe not the most um, diplomatic choice on my part for a Spanish audience, so forgive me for that. Uh, but uh, this was a, a striking image of uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, and there you see her um, as uh, a powerful, uh, powerful stateswoman. And Cleopatra was no less uh, powerful and no less ambitious uh, in her day. So Cleopatra was, we know a fair amount about her, though not as much as we'd like, partly because she did not live to tell the tale. Um, Cleopatra, well, we'll get to the end of the story, but for all sorts of reasons, she doesn't she wasn't able to, to affect the historical tradition as much as she would have liked. She's born in 70 or 69 BC, uh, and by the age of 18 or 19, she was sitting on the throne. She was the daughter of a king, uh, and she became the queen of Egypt in the year 51. She was co-ruler first with her brother Ptolemy XIII. Then when he died in battle, fighting, I should say, against her, she became co-ruler with another brother. Ptolemy the, Thir Ptolemy the 13th was a younger brother. Uh, she became co-ruler with yet an, uh, an even younger brother, Ptolemy the 14th. Um, he died perhaps of poisoning, perhaps at Cleopatra's hand. Cleopatra uh, also had fought off a sister, Arsinoe, for the throne. Uh, Arsinoe uh, went into exile uh, in the city of Ephesus in what is today Turkey. Uh, and there she was executed, possibly at Cleopatra's order. Um, and then Cleopatra, for the rest of her reign, was co-ruler with her son, Ptolemy the Fifteenth Caesar, also known as Caesarian. Caesarian. We'll hear more about him uh, in a moment. Uh, and Cleopatra died around the age of forty in thirty B.C. And we'll hear more about that death. So those are the bare outlines of her rule. I've written about Cleopatra in several of my books. Most recently in this book, The War That Made the Roman Empire, Antony, Cleopatra, and Octavian at Actium, uh, published here in the United States in March, and I hope uh, to be coming out soon in uh, 
in Spanish as well. Well, if you forgive me, I wanted to read an introduction to Cleopatra from this book because I don't think I can say it any better uh, here than I did there. So let me just find the page. Okay, this is an introduction to Cleopatra as a queen. Cleopatra could ride a horse and hunt. She knew how to dignify a throne or go slumming at night in the poorer part of parts of town, organize a fishing party, or build a battle fleet. She could charm a general or confound a philosopher, and she could do it in at least seven languages. She could mix poison like an alchemist or dole out tax breaks like a skillful politician. She stood over her children like a lioness and was devoted to her late father. She was the goddess of love and the goddess of motherhood in the eyes of millions, and both avenger and savior in the eyes of millions more. She reclined beside one lover in a round of banquets in the palace and felt the night air of the river on a cruise down the Nile with another. An hour in her presence, and a man would dream of cities and kingdoms. Generals and statesmen and rebel slaves had failed to defeat Rome, but she came closer than they. Her statue would stand in Egypt long after her death, but it also stood in Rome. Cleopatra fascinated even those who feared her, and she still rivets our attention. She had claimed Egypt's throne since the age of 18 in 51 BC, ruling continuously except for a year or so of forced exile when her brother and co-ruler Ptolemy XIII, along with their sister, drove her out. However, Cleopatra soon turned the tables. She raised an army that defeated her brother in a naval battle in which he drowned, we know what happened to her sister, Arsinoe. She is suspected of having arranged the poisoning of another brother with whom Cleopatra briefly had to share the throne. That left the devious queen to share her throne with her son, a toddler, which meant that in effect, she ruled alone. Cleopatra came from one of the proudest families in the ancient world. The Ptolemies descended from one of Alexander's marshals and they had ruled Egypt for 300 years. Their ranks included a number of strong women of whom Cleopatra was the greatest. During the centuries they ruled, the Ptolemies were the worst of kings and the best. They were greedy, brutal, incestuous voluptuaries whose courts luxuriated in wealth as a sign of power. Among the Ptolemies, there were roly-poly kings and hard-drinking hard -drinking womanizers attended by eunuchs. But the Ptolemies were also astute politicians, careful administrators, and bold strategists. They were builders and visionaries. The Ptolemies presided over one of the most creative eras in the annals of ancient Greek culture. The dynasty built a capital city whose very name bespoke magic, Alexandria. Its lighthouse was accounted one of the seven wonders of the world. Its library was unparalleled and its pleasures were envied. Marble, marbled, multicultural, teeming and resplendent, Alexandria was the greatest metropolis of the Mediterranean, far outstripping in its grandeur, if not its population, a still rather provincial Rome. Well, here you see Egypt um, in the map of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, thanks to the Nile, it uh, was a, a country of enormous agricultural wealth. Indeed, it was probably the wealthiest country in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the entire Roman Empire. The Romans always coveted its wealth. The uh, Ptolemaic dynasty had been founded by this man, Ptolemy I, Ptolemy the Savior, Ptolemy Soter. He was one of Alexander's marshals. And upon Alexander's death, he helped himself to Egypt where he became uh, king. He was proclaimed king. He founded the dynasty, uh, from which Cleopatra sprang. So Cleopatra was at least part Macedonian, descended from Ptolemy I. She was at least part Persian as well, and arguably she was part Egyptian as well. Her mother might have been half Egyptian, and one if not both of her grandmothers might have been at least part Egyptian. The dynasty uh, was famous for speaking Greek, and for building the great city of Alexandria. None of them spoke Egyptian until Cleopatra. She was the first member of this dynasty in its 300 years of history to actually speak the native language of Egypt, which is one of the reasons she was very popular in Egypt. Here we see the Ptolemaic 
kingdom. It ruled Egypt. It expanded into what is now Libya, also into what is now Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, although it had a fight for control of that area with the Seleucid kings, another post-Alexandrian dynasty that ruled from Syria. And the control of that area of the Levant went back and forth. At its height, the Ptolemaic kingdom also had possessions on what is now the coast, the southern coast of Turkey, uh, and even extended its power into mainland Greece briefly, uh, and for a time, very brief time, in Sicily as, as well. It was a great power. It was a great naval power. But by the first century uh, BC, it was well past its prime. And the challenge of the Ptolemies was simply to survive uh, in a world dominated by Rome. Alexandria, as I said, was a very great city. It was the greatest city of the Mediterranean, far more glittering a metropolis than was Rome itself. Here in uh, this mosaic, which comes from uh, what is now northern Israel, uh, we see Alexandria and we see its famous lighthouse, one of the wonders of the world. The Th dynasty was famous for its queens, its powerful queens. Cleopatra was Cleopatra the seventh, the seventh of that name. Uh, and here on this temple wall, we see two of her ancestors, Cleopatra the third and Cleopatra the second. Although they were Greek speakers, uh, the Ptolemies presented themselves to their Egyptian subjects uh, as purely Egyptian, as you see them here on the wall of this temple. This is one of the uh, Ptolemies as well, one of the kings uh, on, on the temple wall. And here we see Cleopatra's father, Ptolemy's, uh, Ptolemy Aletes, Ptolemy the 12th, Ptolemy the flute player, um, perhaps called that because of his devotion to the god Dionysus. Dionysus, of course, is the god of wine, but he's also the god of liberation, and the god whom the Greeks believed had once conquered Asia. That's why Alexander associated himself with Dionysus. Ptolemy XII called himself the new Dionysus. And he sat on the throne of Egypt by sufferance of the Romans. Indeed, he'd had to make lots of concessions to the Romans to stay on his throne. Um, and um, uh, he was in hock for a great deal of money to Rome. Um, his connection with Rome made him unpopular, and for part of his reign, he had to flee to Rome. Here we see the Senate House in Rome uh, to sh take shelter before he was able to return to Egypt. Egypt was such a wealthy place, uh, and Rome was such a powerful country militarily that you might be wondering why the Romans didn't simply annex Egypt. Uh, and the reason is because the leading Roman politicians distrusted each other. They didn't want any one Roman uh, to have the credit for uh, annexing Egypt and to make the connections uh, and to have the powerful clients in Egypt that would accrue to him uh, for conquering it. And so Egypt managed to maintain its independence, but it was a very fragile situation, very delicate. And anyone who wanted to succeed as king of Egypt uh, had to know how to manage the Roman dossier above all. The most important job for any Egyptian was managing Rome. Enter Cleopatra. Uh, she had learned at the feet of her father how to deal with the Romans. And when she became queen, after losing out temporarily in uh, a battle with her brother, she turned to the most powerful Roman of her day. To Julius Caesar, who we see here in uh, a later statue in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. Caesar, as part of his civil war uh, against the Senate, had defeated the forces of the Senate under Pompey in, in Greece at the Battle of Pharsalus in 48. Pompey fled, and Caesar followed him to Egypt. Before Caesar could catch up with him, Pompey was assassinated when he stepped uh, ashore on Egypt uh, at the order of uh, courtiers in, in the Ptolemaic court who had turned against him. Caesar was horrified, or at least he affected to be horrified, about being presented with the severed head of his former rival. 
He went to Alexandria, but he did not have many troops with him, and he was a very uncomfortable position there. He was virtually hostage. And at that point, Cleopatra made her appeal to Caesar. It's one of the most famous entries in history. She entered the royal palace in Alexandria. She'd been exiled by her brother and his advisors. She re-entered by being smuggled in. She was carried from a boat on the Nile, either in a bedding or a carpet. And in either case, she was unraveled at Caesar's feet. And there she made her pitch that Caesar should support her claim to the throne. Uh, she had a good argument. She needed Caesar more than her brother did. She'd been in exile uh, in, uh, in the Levant, and she offered uh, support from her allies there. Uh, and above all, she offered Caesar a lot of money. Or perhaps I shouldn't say above all, because it's clear that her charms were physical as well as political. Now, whether Cleopatra was a great beauty or not uh, is highly disputed debated, as you'll see, uh, and at least some of her coins, she's anything but a beauty. She presents herself as uh, very masculine looking in a way that most people uh, would not find to be the height of feminine beauty. But perhaps she did so because she wanted to represent herself as a queen in a society that was uncomfortable with female rulers who ruled alone. What she really looked like is um, not really clear, but there's no doubt that her personal charms were extraordinary. As I said, she spoke at least seven languages, including Egyptian. Uh, Greek was probably her native language. But possibly she knew Egyptian uh, as a child as well, if her mother really was half Egyptian. Uh, she knew many other languages, including Arabic and, and Hebrew. Um, and um, she probably knew Latin, although that's not listed as one of the languages that that she knew. She was immensely intelligent, and so was Caesar. The two of them together might have represented an extraordinary combination of brains. And it's not hard to see why they became lovers as well as allies. They enjoyed the good life in the palace in Alexandria. And after winning a, a battle, and Caesar was very hard-pressed to win this battle, but of course he was a great soldier, a battle in which her brother drowned in his armor in the Nile. Afterwards, they went on a cruise down the Nile. It was part pleasure cruise, uh, but also in part it was meant uh, to show that Cleopatra had the support of Caesar and Rome behind them to show herself to her subjects. Uh, within a year, Caesar had left, gone off to uh, fight his remaining enemies in the civil war and eventually become the sole dictator of Rome. And Cleopatra was pregnant and the next year she gave birth to a child who she called Ptolemy 15th Caesar. You see, see Cleopatra and her son Ptolemy represented here as Egyptians on the wall of uh, the temple of Hathor at Dendera down the Nile. Now Caesar never officially acknowledged his paternity of uh, C uh, Ptolemy 15th Caesar, Caesarian, Caesarian, but he allowed Cleopatra to uh, name the child, to use this name, give the child this name. Uh, when Cleopatra came to Rome, as she did at least once, if not twice in the following years, while Caesar was still alive, uh, she saw that uh, Caesar uh, had built a new forum in Rome, um, uh, the Forum of Caesar, and the centerpiece of this forum was a temple to the goddess Venus, the ancestor, Venus Genetrix. Venus is the Greek goddess Aphrodite, who is one of the goddesses with whom Cleopatra associated herself, the goddess of love, and also in the Near East, the goddess of war. Cleopatra also associated herself uh, with Isis, uh, the great Egyptian goddess. Anyhow, in Rome, Caesar put a gilded statue of Cleopatra in front of this temple, and there's reason to think that the statue showed her holding her son, a Caesarian, more evidence that Caesar recognized the boy as his own. Well, Cleopatra came to Rome in the year 45, and she was there in 44, 
when Caesar was declared dictator in perpetuity. You see it here on this coin, Caesar dictator perpetuo, Caesar's dictator in perpetuity, and you see him wearing a laurel wreath. But she was also there on the Ides of March in 44, when Caesar was assassinated in the Senate House of Pompey. She was across the river, across the Tiber, living in Caesar's palace, actually Caesar's villa, possibly with her son Caesarian. And it seems that at the time she was pregnant by Caesar with a second child. At least that's the best way to read the sources, most of us think. Uh, unfortunately for her, uh, she had a miscarriage. And shortly afterwards, she went back to, she went back to Egypt. Uh, there, uh, to reestablish her position. By having the protection of Caesar, the most powerful man in the Roman world, Cleopatra could feel secure on her throne in Egypt. But Caesar was gone, and now she had to figure out what she'd need to do to keep that throne. It's clear that she um, negotiated with Caesar's assassins, Brutus and Cassius, the men who called themselves liberators, but ultimately she came down on the side of her former lover, her ex-lover. Uh, he had a successor in Rome. He had a grand nephew, Gaius Octavius, whom Caesar adopted, uh, named in his will as his heir, uh, and the successor, the uh, 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 heir of most of his fortune. But Gaius Octavius, who now starts calling himself Gaius Julius Caesar, but who we historians call Octavian, because his official name would have been Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. Octavian was 18, and it didn't seem likely to most people that he could manage to succeed, not when he had to fight against one of Caesar's lieutenants, who was a great military man, uh, uh, who had been consul, who was consul in 44 at the time of Caesar's death, who was a member of the Roman nobility uh, and a major figure in Rome. Marcus Antonius, Mark Antony. And that's the man whom Cleopatra eventually chooses as Caesar's replacement. The man whom she wants to use, the Roman she wants to use to firm up her position on the throne of Egypt. Here we see a coin that was issued uh, uh, in the next decade in the 30s. On the left, we see Cleopatra. And on the right, we see Mark Antony. The coin, the inscription is in Greek. If you look at Antony on the right, uh, you can see that he is shown as a very strong man, um, as a perhaps a descendant of Hercules, with whom he associated himself. You can see his, his bull neck and his strong features. On the left, you see Cleopatra. And here she is a mature woman. Uh, her nose uh, is aquiline, uh, perhaps to be described as masculine. Uh, it's somewhat represent, represent reminiscent of coin portrayals of her father. You can see that, she again, she has a remarkable hairstyle. Uh, she's wearing uh, jewelry, earrings, a necklace, decked out like a queen and wearing the ribbon of royalty. Uh, she's meant to look imposing rather than seductive. And this is the pair who built up their power in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, Cleopatra was not bothered by the fact um, that um, uh, Antony was actually married uh, first to a Roman noblewoman named Fulvia. And when she died, uh, Antony, uh, after having a quarrel with his rival Octavian, patched it up and married Octavian's sister, Octavia, by whom he had two daughters. Nonetheless, by Cleopatra, um, he would end up having three children, two twins, uh, and then a, a second son, a boy and a girl, and then a second son. Cleopatra had presented herself to Antony at the city of Tarsus in southern Turkey. Uh, she had arrived there in one of the great arrivals in history, on a barge, on a Ptolemaic barge. I can't resist reading Shakespeare's description of how Cleopatra presented herself when she met Mark Antony. It comes from Antony and Cleopatra. The barge she sat in, like a burnished throne, burned on the water. The poop was beaten gold, purple the sails, and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver, 
which to the tune of flutes kept stroke, and made the water which they beat to follow faster, as amorous of their strokes. For her own person, it beggared all description. She did lie in her pavilion cloth of gold of tissue, or picturing that Venus where we see the fancy outworked nature. On each side her stood pretty dimpled boys, like smiling cupids, with diverse colored fans, whose wind did seem to glow the delicate cheeks which they did cool, and what they undid, did. It was hard for Antony to resist Cleopatra. But of course, he wasn't only accepting Cleopatra as a lover, but also as a partner, as a ruler of the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Antony and Octavian divided the Roman Empire between the two of them, with Octavian taking the west and Antony taking the east. The east was by far the wealthier and more populous part of the empire, and Cleopatra, as queen of Egypt, represented the greatest wealth of all. Antony used his position to build up a series of client states on Rome's eastern frontier and to prepare himself for what he considered to be uh, the greatest of all his challenges, to make war on the Parthian Empire, the last empire standing in the east, uh, the one that Caesar had planned to attack uh, on uh, before at the top before he was assassinated in 44 BC. So let's look how this played out. Here we see a, a tapestry, a uh, early modern tapestry. It shows Antony and Cleopatra in Alexandria, where they have were said to enjoy a glittering court life. Uh, here is a, one of the famous stories about Cleopatra told Antony, boasted to Antony that she could give the most expensive dinner party in the history of the world. And she did this by dissolving a pearl, a very valuable pearl in uh, in acetic acid, in vinegar. Uh, the story says that it dissolved instantly and she drank it, thereby giving the world's um, most expensive dinner party indeed. Uh, in reality, it probably took 24 hours to the, for the pearl to dissolve, but dissolve it would have, as modern experiments showed. Uh, this is just one of the ways in which Cleopatra was able to amuse Antony. Uh, there... Um, their sporting, uh, their way of life was legendary. Excuse me a second. Just want to close my window here. Excuse me. One of my neighbors is a folk singer, and I think she has started. Okay, back to Cleopatra. Uh, this uh, statue may represent one of Antony and Cleopatra's children, Alexander Helios, Alexander the son. And here, uh, this shows the, a young boy uh, dressed in Eastern garb, dressed like a ruler of Media Atropatine, northwestern Parthia, as uh, Antony and Cleopatra claim that their son one day would be. Now, financed by uh, Cleopatra, uh, Antony attempted uh, war on the uh, Parthian Empire. Uh, he attacked the northwestern part of the empire, Media Atro Atropatine, as I've called it, uh, what is nowadays northwestern Iran. And his campaign there was a total failure. Um, he was defeated. His siege train was taken by the enemy. His ally, Armenia, betrayed him. And Antony had to fight his way back over icy roads in the winter. He had to fight his way back to the coast. He lost perhaps as much as 25% of his army, uh, which was a, an enormous loss. Uh, and he had to go back to uh, Cleopatra's embrace. He was more dependent on Cleopatra than ever as a result of this. Meanwhile, in the West, Octavian had gone from success to success, building up his own power. Octavian had had to fight um, Pompey's son, Sextus Pompey, who created a naval empire based on, in Sicily. And uh, through a difficult but ultimately successful campaign, Octavian was able to defeat uh, Sextus Pompey entirely uh, uh, and to drive him out of the West and seeking refuge in the East. Octavian had the help uh, of his great ally and partner, Marcus Agrippa, 
who has uh, turned out to be one of uh, antiquity's most impressive admirals. So Antony goes back to Egypt, as I said, after, uh, after losing in Parthia, uh, but he's able to rebuild his army and he goes on another campaign and gets revenge on Armenia, which had betrayed him. He now conquers Armenia, adds it to the Roman Empire, and he returns to Egypt to Alexandria in triumph, uh, where he celebrates a victory parade uh, that some saw as uh, an Eastern imitation of a Roman triumph, but others in the tradition of the great Alexandrian, great Ptolemaic victory parades. And at a ceremony in Alexandria, Antony uh, announces several things. First, he announces that uh, each of his children uh, shall become the ruler of a uh, great kingdom. His daughter would become the ruler of Cyrenica. One of his sons uh, would be the ruler of the Levant, and another would become the ruler of Media, and indeed Antony claimed the Parthian Empire. Because Antony was getting ready uh, for uh, a, a second round, a rematch against the Parthians. He was building up his army, but in the was not to be, because in the West, Octavian decided to make war on Antony. He wasn't going to wait for Antony um, to uh, win, be successful in Parthia, and then possibly turn on Octavian. Octavian felt the moment was now. Now, one of the reasons that Octavian felt that this was the moment to make war on Antony was that one of the things that Antony and Cleopatra proclaimed at that ceremony in, uh, in Alexandria was that there was that Caesarian, Cleopatra's son by Julius Caesar was the true and only heir of Julius Caesar. This is a real threat to Octavian, who called himself Julius Caesar and who claimed to be Caesar's adopted son. There could only be one son of Caesar, as far as Octavian was concerned. In addition to this, Octavian had the help of some defectors from Antony and Cleopatra. There were some in Antony's camp who were unhappy with the power that the Egyptian queen, a non-Roman, had over the Roman general. And it's clear that she had power over him. Cleopatra had power over Antony, partly because of her wealth, and partly because of her brains, and partly because of her charms. She was a greater strategist than Antony. It's hard to avoid that conclusion. And many of the Romans saw it. They didn't like what they were seeing. They didn't like the power of a woman, of a stateswoman, and they didn't like the power of someone who was Greek and perhaps part Egyptian. And so they defected. They went back to Italy. And in Rome, Octavian decides to make war. But he declares war not on Antony, but rather on Cleopatra. Now, Cleopatra had done nothing that would allow Oct Antony excuse me, allow Octavian to make war on her. There was no real casus belli. So Octavian had to say that what Cleopatra had done was corrupt a noble Roman, that she had corrupted Mark Antony. Uh, and Octavian claimed to have found Antony's will that he had kept with the Vestal Virgins in Rome, kept for safekeeping with the Vestal Virgins. Octavian entirely illegally helped himself to this will, and he claimed, it said, uh, that Antony was giving away the store to Cleopatra and that he even wanted to be buried in Alexandria with Cleopatra rather than in Rome like a good Roman, who, by the way, technically happened to still be married to Octavian's sister, Octavia. So it was a declaration of war. Octavian shrewdly did not declare war on a fellow Roman, Antony, a civil war that would have been most unwelcome to the Roman people, but rather he declared war on Cleopatra. But Cleopatra and Antony had not been sitting back idly. They were prepared. While this was going on, they had built a new fleet. Now, Rome was only a sometime naval power. It certainly had built a fleet to defeat Hannibal and, excuse me, to defeat the Carthaginians in the First Punic War and still was a superior naval power at the time of the Second Punic War against Hannibal. 
Uh, but by the first century BC, Rome had allowed its naval power to wither. Octavian in the west had to build a new fleet and Antony in the east built a new one as well. But his fleet was funded by Cleopatra and probably built by naval architects at Alexandria, which was a great center of naval architecture and maritime uh, business in general. They built a fleet uh, which is absolutely state of the art. It's, it's bigger than uh, Octavian's fleet with 500 warships, but also it contains ships that are better. Uh, it's got ships with reinforced prows, uh, so they are better at ramming than the enemy ships. And it also has a certain number of very large ships, ships that can break through a, uh, a fortified harbor uh, and allow uh, Antony to attack, uh, attack a harbor town and bring the war to Italy. And that's what it looks like he's going to do in the year 32 BC. These reinforced ships can attack a place like Brundisium or Tarentum, the two great ports of southeastern Italy. And should they be able to break through there, they would allow Antony to march on Rome. So that seems to be the strategy at the time of this war. And so in 32 BC, Antony and Cleopatra, they gather their fleet at Ephesus here uh, uh, in the coast of modern what today is Turkey. Now, many of Antony's allies want Cleopatra to go home. Thank you for bringing the ships. Thank you for bringing the treasure. Now, please go, please go back to Alexandria because we have no room for a woman and we have no room for an Egyptian queen in the Roman army. But Cleopatra refuses. She says quite rightly that she is Antony's ally, that she represents Egypt, and like any allied monarch, she wants to fight uh, with Antony. She wants to fight with her champion, besides which she doesn't trust him. She doesn't trust him to make a deal behind his back, uh, behind her back, excuse me, that might betray Egypt and her power. Some of the Romans are very unhappy about this. A number of them are very unhappy about this. But Cleopatra insists and she gets her way. Antony first dismisses her and then says, on second thought, Cleopatra, you may stay. And so she does. And so in the uh, summer and fall of 32, the flotilla uh, sails first to the island of Samos, then to Athens, and then to northwestern Greece. While in Athens, Antony divorces his Roman wife, Octavia. On the one hand, that doesn't play very well with the Roman public. On the other hand, he's closer than ever to Cleopatra. And to the east, where Cleopatra is a goddess, the avenger of the east, it might look as if Antony's an even greater power than ever now that he's joined himself entirely with Cleopatra. So Antony and Cleopatra's fleet now takes up their position along the coast of Greece, all the way from the island of Corsaira, modern Corfu in the north, down to the fortress of Methoni in the south and here at Tynarum, uh, Tynarum um, in, in the central southern Peloponnesus as well. Whereas Antony and Cleopatra spend the winter at the city of Patrai, modern Patras in Greece. The main naval place is a place on the Gulf of Ar uh, Arcarnania, uh, the Gulf of Ambracia, it's called mostly, uh, Actium. Let's take a look at Actium in a moment. Now, what's their strategy? What's their purpose? Well, you might have thought their strategy would be to take this great fleet that they've built and sail across the Ionian Sea and attack Brunzesium or attack Tarentum, but they don't. They stay here in Greece through the winter, and they're still there in the spring of um, the next year, 32 BC, when the war comes to them. Why don't they take the war to Italy. Now, Julius Caesar would never have stayed in Greece. Julius Caesar would have attacked Italy. Julius Caesar believed in taking strategic risks and always being active. Antony and Cleopatra follow a different route. Is it because Antony has been burned in his war against Parthia and learned uh, that by jumping ahead, he might risk having great losses in his rear as he did in Parthia? Is it because he's grown older and more cautious? Or is it because Cleopatra has told him 
that she wants him to stay in Greece, that she doesn't want to risk sending her fleet abroad and, and break and going even further away from Italy? Or is it because for public relations reasons, for propaganda reason, Antony doesn't dare invade Italy with an Egyptian queen and his lover in tow? It's not clear, but for all these reasons, they stay on the defensive in Greece, waiting for the enemy to come to them. And come to them, the enemy does. In March of the year 32, the enemy, uh, led by uh, uh, Octavian's Admiral Agrippa, makes a daring attack across the Ionian Sea, and they attack not Actium, the main base, or not Pachai, where Antony and Cleopatra are, but rather Methoni. Uh, which is the key lifeline to the east. Uh, the army and navy of Antony and Cleopatra in Greece cannot feed itself on the resources of Greece. The food has to be shipped all the way from Egypt and Syria and in the east, and it goes through an island chain, through the Greek islands, to Tynarum, to uh, Methoni, uh, which is one of the great ports of this part of the world. And Agrippa succeeds in surprising the enemy at Methoni, uh, catching him there unawares, and taking control of this key fortress. Forever afterwards, for the rest of the campaign, uh, Antony and Cleopatra are having trouble feeding their army. It's now March of the year 31 BC. Antony and Cleopatra go north to Actium, making that their base. Meanwhile, Octavian sails from Brindisium with the rest of his fleet, sails along the coast, and he establishes a base just north of Actium. Here we see the place. We see Antony and Cleopatra's camp. Uh, you see uh, the small city of Actium here. You see the entrance to the Gulf of Ambracia. And you see Octavian's camp about five miles to the north uh, in the hills uh, above uh, uh, above the um, above Actium. Antony uh, fortifies the entrance to the Gulf. His fleet is here. Octavian, uh, and he, Antony also establishes a second camp north of Actium, north of the entrance of the Gulf, to try to harass Octavian. But he's unsuccessful. Octavian holds the high ground. At first, he's forced to uh, have his ships here on the Bay of Gomorrah, which is open to the winds. But then, uh, thanks to Agrippa, Octavian takes control of the strategic island of Lucas and manages to have a good harbor there for his ships as well. Little by little, Octavian and Agrippa are closing the noose around Antony and Cleopatra in the spring and summer of 31 BC. Starving the men out, uh, leaving them uh, prey to disease, to dysentery and malaria, uh, and reaching a position by uh, late summer in which it becomes clear that Antony and Cleopatra can't defeat the enemy. They need to escape from Actium, and they decide to do so by a naval battle. They have to lose their land army, and they know it but they think it's safer to escape by sea for a lot of reasons, but not the least of them is that Cleopatra has brought with her one of her greatest strengths, her treasure. The treasury of Alexandria is with her. She's got 60 ships, no small number of ships, uh, and a large force of armed men. By the time the day of the battle comes, the Battle of Actium on September 2nd, 31 BC, Antony and Cleopatra are down to 230 ships. Originally, they had 500 warships. They have to burn a large number of their ships because they simply don't have the manpower for them anymore. They don't have enough men and healthy enough men to, to row and sail these ships. And there's been many desertions to uh, the enemy's camp. The battle that they fight is essentially a breakout battle. They want to escape with as much of their navy as they possibly can. They know that they will lose a certain portion of it. They're hoping that maybe they'll get lucky and they will able to be able to defeat the enemy Navy at Actium, but probably the best they can do is escape. And indeed, that's what happens on the day of the battle. They do escape. 
Here we see a uh, a relief of a Roman warship uh, uh, from a later period from uh, Italy. Uh, you can see it's associated with Egypt. Here you see this crocodile. And this might give us some image of what a Roman warship was like at the time of the Battle of Actium. Cleopatra has been accused of having uh, fled in cowardice from the battle, but instead she actually is very courageous and she leads uh, a well-planned retreat that allows her to escape with all 60 of her ships and Antony is able to follow her with just a small number of his ships. He loses most of his ships, he loses most of his men, he loses his pride, but he escapes from the battle with Cleopatra and her treasury with the hope that somehow uh, they might be able to fight again another day. They go back to Egypt, uh, and there they attempt to establish resistance to Octavian, who's won a tremendous victory at battle, at Actium. Well, now comes, in a way, Cleopatra's finest hour, Cleopatra's finest hour uh, in Egypt. Antony, we're told, is depressed, but not Cleopatra. She rallies to the occasion. Um, she uh, rallies her troops. She tries to build a new fleet in the Gulf of Suez that would allow her to escape to India, of all places. But Hellenistic Egypt, Ptolemaic Egypt, has been doing a lively trade with India. And this might be the one place she could escape to. Unfortunately, her enemies, the Nabataean Arabs, get wind of this and they burn the fleet before she's able to use it. She and Antony talk about escaping to Spain or Gaul as well, uh, where they might lead a resistance against the Romans. There's been a, uh, a long-term resistance against Rome uh, in Spain already under Sertorius and be, before then under uh, the local hero Viriathus. So it's not totally out of the question. But instead, what Cleopatra settles for is a different plan, to dump Antony. Octavian, and here, here's the Battle of Actium. Here's the waters off Actium where the battle was fought. We'll leave there for a second. Octavian makes his way to Egypt in the summer of the next year, the summer of 30 BC. And as he's approaching, Antony and Cleopatra each um, negotiate with him, each attempt to negotiate a, an agreement that will allow them to live. Uh, Antony wants to live in exile. Cleopatra wants to keep her throne in Egypt. She ditches Antony, or at least she wants to be able to keep her children on that throne. But Octavian is non-committal, although he does tell Cleopatra she has to get rid of Antony. Antony tries to go out and fight Octavian, uh, but to make a long story short, he fails. And on August 1st, after having essentially been uh, uh, betrayed by all his troops outside of Alexandria, he goes back to the city only to be told that Cleopatra is dead. She gives out the false report that she's committed suicide to force Antony in committing, into committing suicide. And he does. At least he attempts to. He fails. It's a botched job. It's not easy to commit suicide. And as he is dying, he is brought to Cleopatra's half-finished mausoleum. It's a mausoleum and fortress because she's barred herself in there along with her treasure. And there, Antony is, is brought up by... Um, a system of pulleys. It's quite sad, quite pathetic. And he dies in Cleopatra's arms, as we see here in this, in this print uh, from a later era. Cleopatra is indeed sad, but she now has to make her peace with Octavian, who enters, uh, who enters Alexandria in triumph. And he waits 10 days before he finally sees Cleopatra. Whether she calls the meeting here, he does, is disputed in the sources. And now we come to maybe the most dramatic part of the legend, how Cleopatra deals with Octavian. They have a meeting. She throws herself at his mercy. The sources disagree as to exactly what she said and what he said and what was done. But it's clear that she is bargaining. She wants her children to survive. Her three children by Antony are in town. She sent her child, her son by Cleop by Caesar, Caesarian, Caesarian. She sent him south to try to make his way to India. Whether Antony Octavian makes any promises or, or not 
is unclear. But Cleopatra will not allow herself to be humiliated by Octavian. She will now not allow herself to march in triumph in Rome. And perhaps Octavian will be just as happy if she doesn't do so. Because if she does march in triumph in Rome, there'll be pressure on him to allow her to live. And Cleopatra alive represents a threat to Octavian. In any case, around the 10th of August, Cleopatra ends the game. The sources tell us that she commits suicide. It's one of the most famous and dramatic suicides in history. The sources tell us that they're not really sure how she committed suicide. There's one version that she did so by taking poison. That Alexandria was a great medical center and Cleopatra had experimented on poisons uh, with various uh, prisoners who she uh, had, uh, she killed them by seeing which poison would be the least painful and the most quick acting. Uh, not exactly a respecter of human rights. But the story that was most popular is that she committed suicide by having a snake, an asp, smuggled in in a basket of figs and had the asp bite her and die. Now, an asp is not a technical term. The snake that we'd be talking about would be a cobra. A large cobra is much too large to uh, be smuggled in, in a basket of figs or anything else. But a baby cobra is only 12 to 18, 18 inches long. And according to my work with herpetologists, was plenty big enough to do the job. And so we have the illustrations beginning in antiquity. And here you see one uh, from uh, Baroque Italy of Cleopatra taking a cobra, putting it to her breast and committing suicide that way. Whether she did that or not is unknown to us. Uh, the Roman sources embraced the idea that she did and that she settled her own destiny by dying this way. And Octavian finds her too late. She's already dead. He brings in experts in snake bites to try to uh, suck out the poison, we're told, but it's too late. There are some scholars who say this is all made up and that Octavian actually executed her. And he made up this uh, unlikely story of uh, and Cleopatra committing suicide and with a cobra, the symbol of Egyptian royalty. But I'd like to think that the story is true. And I'd like to think that the Roman poet Horace gets it right when he has this description of Cleopatra's end. Amid her ruined halls, she stood unblenched and fearless to the end, grasped the fell snakes, that all her blood might with the cold black venom blend death's purpose flushing in her face. Nor to our ships the glory gave that she, no vulgar dame, should grace a triumph crownless and a slave. No triumph for Cleopatra. Well, in Rome, Octavian does have his triumph. He annexes Egypt, and while he is at it, he has Cleopatra's son, Caesarian, murdered. Her three children by Antony are allowed to live. They go back to Rome. The boys do not survive, but the daughter, Cleopatra Selene, does. And she eventually becomes the queen of uh, the kingdom of Mauritania here in the Roman West. And she establishes a glittering court there, indeed one that might have been worthy of her mother. In Rome, Octavian is triumphant. Here you see a coin showing a triumphal arch with a quadriga, a four-horse chariot, um, uh, Ill illustrative of his victory. And here you see his name, Caesar. And here a coin of Octavian, or as he becomes known shortly after his success, Augustus, the reverend one, the revered one. Uh, we think of him as the first of the Roman emperors. But let's not end on this note. Let's remember um, that uh, he almost lost everything to a, in a war in which a woman, in which the queen of Egypt, using a Roman as her muscle, as you will, with her part through her partnership through Mark Antony, forced Octavian to risk everything and almost took the Roman Empire away from him. If she had won, History would have been changed in incalculable ways, and Alexandria would have become a Constantinople avant la lettre, before the letter. 
it would have become a second capital of the Roman Empire. And we can all, can't even begin to suggest, guess how that would have changed the course of history. It was not to be, but nonetheless, Cleopatra, as we see here in this French uh, chalk uh, drawing, Cleopatra was truly one of history's great stateswomen. So thank you. Um, it's really been a, a pleasure to uh, to speak today about one of my favorite subjects. Uh, thank you again for inviting me, um, and um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you, Professor. It was a most remarkable speech. So, um, and if you have, you know, a few minutes for a Q and A, that would sure. be it yeah. would be kind of individual. Yeah. And that I will play the spokesperson for the audience, if I may. Yeah, great. And um, I have a couple of questions that are related to to your speech, and one um, and one question that actually is tangentially related, but mm -hmm. uh, this being Spain is about Hispania. Mm -hmm. So the, the the two questions that I have um, in regards to your speech, uh -huh. this um, first of all. Um, if Cleopatra had not run into Antony, had not made war to Octavian uh, in the way they did, um, would Cleopatra have avoided uh, her fate at the hands of, of Octavian? In other words, could, could have she finagled her way into uh, an Octavian sort of uh, framework of power her being, you know, one of the queens of the or kings of the outposts mm -hmm. of Octavian in, in the East. Is, is this conceivable? It's a great question, and it is conceivable, but only at a terrible price. Cleopatra had a problem. Her problem was her son, Caesarian, the son of Julius Caesar. Octavian claimed to be the son of Julius Caesar. He called himself uh, Caesar. Uh, he always called himself uh, Caesar. Uh, he took the title the son of a god. He had Caesar deified, so he became the son of a god. And it was a real embarrassment for him that Caesarian was almost certainly Caesar's birth son. Um, and so I don't think Octavian would have tolerated uh, the continued existence of Caesarian. Uh, Cleopatra was a ruthless ruler, but she was also a woman and a mother. And I, I don't see Cleopatra agreeing to the murder of her son. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Herod, uh, Herod the Great, uh, a contemporary of hers, uh, consented and ordered the murder of his own children. And maybe Cleopatra was ruthless enough to do that. But I think she would have had to do that in order to survive in a world dominated by Octavian. My second question is, um, reading your, your book, the, the Civil War That Made the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. um, take away that, that most of us have is that, is that, and you verbalize it at various times as well in interviews and so forth, um, that the Roman Civil War and Actium in, in particular sealed the fate of the Roman Republic yeah. provided the impetus for a Rome-centered, um, Western-looking Roman Empire, as opposed to looking Alexandria-centered Roman Empire mm -hmm. uh, had Cleopatra and Antony prevail in the Civil War. Um, and that, in a way, Alexandria would have become Constantinople only five centuries earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, could you go one better in imagining um, Alexandria being center of the Roman Empire uh, and Rome, the city of Rome, becoming an outpost of, of the empire <laughs> of the kind of Hispania or, or Gaul? Is that even conceivable? Yeah, it's another another great question. Um, I think that Rome. Italy was too wealthy at that point, or by the first century uh, BC, to become an outpost like 
uh, Gaul or Hispania in that period. But your point is well taken. I think if if Antony and Cleopatra had won, Alexandria's uh, star would have have risen considerably, and it, it might have been the case that the center of gravity moved eastward, uh, and to the point that Alexandria was the real capital, and Rome was Rome was the second capital. There there certainly were empires in antiquity that had more than one capital. Uh, the Parthian Empire. Um, it was not ruled from Parthia, but it was ruled from from Mesopotamia, um, and uh, likewise in 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 Sasanian, Sasanian times. So it, it's possible. I mean, I think we tend to underestimate we we tend to underestimate the pull of the East in the Roman Empire. I think in pract for practical purposes, the Roman Empire was a Greco-Roman Empire. Latin never became the language of the East. Um, Greek was always the dominant language and, and always played a hugely important role in, in Roman culture. I like to ask my students what the best-selling book of the Roman Empire is. Uh, and the answer, of course, is the New Testament, which was written in Greek, not Latin. Um, the second best-selling, or, or the Bible in, in, entirely, the second best-selling book today of the Roman Empire is the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, which was also written in Greek not Latin. Um, I think there are real indications of where the cultural center of gravity was in the Roman world, and it would have been even more so um, had Antony and Cleopatra won. And finally, Professor, this being Spain, I just cannot, <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about uh, Hispania. Yeah. And the role of Hispania in shaping up the, the early days of the empire. I mean, you've Yes. Talk about how Octavian spends six months of his, um, you know, of his time in in uh, in Hispania with Julius Caesar, mm -hmm. that, that being, uh, you know, important in in determining the the mind of Julius Caesar at the time of of, of yeah. questioning his will, and, and also how um, the patricians of the Republic, the Caesars, uh, they, they were. That set against the idea of uh, enlarging the, um, uh, the, the the granting of nationality to um, uh, folks from from Hispania and so forth. Right, right, yeah. And so the, and there is the uh, there is the, uh, the the matter of the couple of um, um, Roman uh, um, imperators who were born in Spain. Um, yes. So how 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 important was Hispania in in that early years of the empire, in particular? It was it was very important, as you rightly say. Uh, uh, Octavian had sealed the deal with his great uncle Julius Caesar in Hispania. Um, the last land battle of the civil war, the battle of Caesar's civil war, was fought at Munda in in southern Spain. And uh, although Octavian wasn't there at the time of the battle, he arrived shortly afterwards and he's with Caesar while Caesar is engaged in a mopping up campaign in in southern Hispania. Um, the battle was fought against by fought by Pompey's two sons, one of whom dies shortly afterwards and the other goes on as Sextus uh, uh, to have this naval empire. Um, it's there that Caesar concludes that his his young great nephew really is the one he's the one who should uh, be his heir caesar doesn't have any roman sons of his own technically caesarian is probably a roman citizen because cleopatra is probably technically a roman citizen since her father was made a roman citizen but i don't think the romans were too impressed by by that they they, they didn't have a high opinion of a foreigner so for practical purposes uh caesar didn't have a roman son he'd had a daughter who died uh, and uh, so it's in Hispania that Caesar decides to choose Octavian. When he goes back to Rome that autumn, he changes his will and he makes Gaius Octavius, his great nephew, into his heir. He had several other close relatives who, could, who he could have chosen. Or he could even have chosen Mark Antony, who was a very distant cousin, but he doesn't, he doesn't choose him. Uh, other ways in which Hispania is important in this earlier period is, um, so are there, uh, 
the king of Mor Mauritania was a man named Bogud, and he had fought at the Battle of, M of Munda. In fact, he had led a cavalry charge that was decisive in Julius Caesar's victory. After Caesar's assassination, he had supported Mark Antony, which was the wrong choice for him. He went back to Hispania and, and fought against Octavian there, and he's defeated, driven out, and Octavian supports his brother uh, in a campaign against him, and Bogut is forced out of Mauritania and goes to fight for Antony in the east. In fact, he's the guy who's in charge of, of um, Methoni when it's uh, defeated when he's conquered by Agrippa, who kills him shortly afterwards. Um, as you say, the senatorial elite was dead set on granting citizenship to prominent provincials uh, from places like Hispania or Gallia or anywhere else in the empire. And that's one of the reasons why they go down to defeat. Men like Pompey and Caesar understand otherwise. They understand that you have to make common cause with the provincial elites. If you want to govern this empire of 50 million people, the Romans ultimately govern this empire with an army of 300,000 men. That's really a very small force to govern an empire of 50 million people that stretches over 3,000 miles. And one of the results is that there are many, many, many rebellions. Hispania, uh, it took well over a century for Rome to tame Hispania, which didn't want to be um, conquered by Rome. And uh, they're sort of on the honor roll of people who rebelled against the Romans and the rebellions go on over the centuries. The first century uh, of our era is one of the golden ages of rebellions against Rome, but it continues into the second century. And it's partly because the Romans don't have a very big army and because they don't make enough deals with provincial elites. So in a way, Hispanius showing the way to other areas conquered by the Romans as to how you can fight back. Thank you ever so much, Professor. I think we have presumed long enough upon you. Uh, so uh, we are uh, very grateful and very appreciative that you have, you uh, you know, took time of your schedule to address the Diplomatic Academy here. And we can only dream to have you a second time in the future. So Well, thank you. You're so kind. It's a great honor for me to be able to, to speak to you. I enjoyed it. And I, I wish you all the best with the continuation of your series, which I, which I know will be terrific. Thank you, Professor. Thanks so You're much. You're welcome. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. And I look forward to, I look forward to learning more about your work. All right. Uh, you will. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. Bye.